We'll be in the book of James chapter 4. James chapter 4. I read a story recently of a pilot who was flying in a small aircraft and he encountered trouble. He called the, to the tower to report in his predicament. Pilot to tower, he said. I'm 300 miles from the airport, 600 feet above the ground. I'm out of fuel. I'm descending rapidly. Please advise. Almost immediately, a response came back over his radio. Tower to pilot, repeat after me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, I'm hoping that that was not a true story. I'm, I'm hoping that, that that was a joke. But you know, unfortunately, I think many times we do the exact same thing. Many times we view prayer as a last resort. Many, when all else has failed, we pray. In, in the book of Luke, chapter 11, the disciples were, were seeking instruction from Jesus. Now, you, of all the things that, they, that Jesus could teach them, you, you think, but they didn't ask him how to heal the sick. And that's why they didn't ask him how to raise the dead. The disciples weren't interested in Jesus' secret for walking on water or his recipe for multiplying the loaves and the fishes. But if you remember in Luke chapter 11, the instructions they sought, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Out of all the things that they had learned from Jesus, I believe that these men knew that prayer was central to everything in their relationship with Jesus. I believe that they knew that prayer was the most important thing, and they wanted to have a prayer life, just like the one they saw in Jesus. So they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, I'll confess to you this morning. If you were to ask me what I thought was the weakest area of my Christian life, without hesitation, I will tell you. Now, I know in my life, you know, where I was, where I am now, I know the difference that's there, but, but still today, I will tell you, the weakest area of my Christian life is prayer. I never feel like I pray enough. I never feel like my, my prayer life is, is what it should be. I often feel that my prayer life's lacking. And you know what I guess? I guess that some of you probably would say the same thing. When it comes to evaluating ourselves, some of you might say, I could definitely use some help in my prayer life as well. This morning, I want us to look at some of the things that James teaches us to help us to have a greater prayer. The passage I chose is James chapter 4. Uh, let's begin together in verse 1. James chapter 4, verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts, the, the war in your members? You lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss. And, and that, that you may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwells in us lusteth to envy? But he gives more grace. Wherefore he says, God resisteth the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will drive, draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. 
Let your laughter return to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Now, what James is teaching us, he's teaching them a lot of stuff. But he's also teaching them about their prayer life. I want us this morning to pull from there three simple steps to a greater prayer life. Because I want to guess, maybe I hope that every one of you can say my prayer life is strong. I might be the only one in the place with a weak prayer life, but my guess is I'm not. I want us to, to, to know that we can have a greater prayer life. And James is going to give us three simple steps to do that. And as we look at these steps, I want you to know, you're going to look at them, and you already know these things. And you're going to look at it and you're going, is it that simple? The answer is yes. But the three simple steps. Step number one, you have to pray. Very simple. The first step to a greater prayer life, you have to pray. If you take a minute and look at verses one and two again, James says, that, that we got all this junk going on trying to, to for our life to have more. And, and he gives all these things. You, there's wars and there's fightings. And, and basically says you got all this stuff going on so that you can have more. You want to be a better person. You, you want to be well liked. You, you, want to, you want to be in a circle of friends. You, you want to be respected. And all these things. we got all this junk going on in our life because we want more. You've done all these things to try to achieve, but you're missing the most important thing. He, he tells him here, he, he, he says, that there, there's wars and fightings among you. That there's lust, and, 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 and you, you kill, and you desire to have more. But he says, you miss the most important thing. Yeah, I think for some of us, we're like a young lad that I, that I heard about who was trying to move a, a large stone. And, he was, trying, and he, he was trying with everything he could. And his muscles were straining and the sweat was pouring off of him. And he tried everything he could to move this stone. And as he was working so hard on the stone, the, the father was kind of off to the side and watching him. And, and, and slightly amused at the boy, just giving everything he had. And just, just he was he grunting and, and I don't to try to move this stuff. Finally, the dad goes to him and says, Son, are you using everything you have to move that stuff? The boy says, Yeah, dad. Yeah, I'm using all the strength I have to, to move that stuff. And the father says, No, son, you're not. You haven't asked me to have more. I think sometimes, sometimes in our prayer life, we're forgetting that most important thing. We're trying with everything we can to get it done. But we haven't asked the one who can for help. Now it sounds really simple. How to have a great prayer life? It starts with you have to pray. But often I think we struggle, we strain, we wrestle, and we can't get what we want. Maybe it's because we're not enlisting the help from the one who can. Maybe it's because we're not asking for that help. Maybe it's because we're just not praying. Now, I know, I know. We, we, we say our prayers. When we say a few words when we, we sit down for our food. And maybe a few words before we go to bed. Maybe even a few more when we get up in the morning. But are we really, are we really praying? You realize that prayerlessness is sin? Scripture commands us to pray. And, and to not be praying, that's sin. But unfortunately, I think that today, many Christians do not pray. I, I tell you, there's a lot of stuff that, that we as Old Fields Baptist Church could be doing. I mean, if you look at our to-do list, it's huge. I mean, there's a lot of people that need to hear about Jesus. In the past weeks, I've given you some numbers. 70% of our friends and neighbors don't go to anybody's church on any given Sunday. That's not talking about the ones who go occasionally. So, so a lot of folks need to hear about Jesus. 
We have a lot of wayward brothers and sisters that need to be brought back into the flock. That there's work that needs to be done on our building. That there's, there's a community that needs to be reached for Jesus. There's a whole lot to do. And you know what I think sometimes we as Christians and in Oldfields Baptist Church become guilty of? We wrestle and we strain and we struggle to try to do all this stuff. But we don't ask God for help. We try to do all this without praying. And you say, well, I don't know about the church. i got a whole lot going on in my life. I, I, I've got this worry and this fear and, and this on occasion. And, and our list can go on and on and on. And you know what sometimes we're guilty of doing? Trying to wrestle and strain and struggle so that we can make it right. And we forget the most important thing. we got to ask. So our first step to a great prayer life is just so simple. we got to pray. But then as we pray, there's a danger. And that leads me to the second step. The second thing we have to know is we have to avoid praying foolishly. If you look at verses 3 and 4, it says, You ask and you receive not because you ask a miss that you may consume it on your lusts. What they're doing is they're praying. James says, I know that some of you are praying, but you're still not getting what you asked for because you ask with the wrong motive. You ask, you ask for yourself. You, you ask for things to be promoted in your life. You, you ask for, for selfish reasons. The things you ask for is to satisfy you. <coughs> we ever take an inventory of what we do pray for? Is what we pray for, is it for ourselves? Now, there's nothing wrong with, with asking things for ourselves. But is our, is our motive to glorify us, to make us better? Is it a selfish motive? James says you ask for all these things you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives. The, they were, these folks were praying unacceptable prayers to God because they were simply asking for themselves. They were kind of asking God to, to underwrite their selfishness. God, I, I'm up against this wall and I need this. Will you give it to me to help me through? To get me beyond? Lord, I need this. I want this. Will you just underwrite that? He said, you have me, but you, you ask for the wrong reasons. So what kind of prayers are acceptable? If these folks were praying, but they were praying for the wrong reasons, well, what is acceptable? I believe that an acceptable prayer is when our prayers are making glorifying God our first priority. When our prayer life is about God being glorified <coughs> instead of us being glorified. James kind of gives us an illustration in verse 4. Look what it says. It says, you adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. So you think, well, what is he talking about there? He's kind of giving us a picture. He calls them adulterers and adulteresses, unfaithful people. And what he's doing is he's giving us a picture of marriage. Now, now let, let me help you with this picture. And we always pick on the guys, so this morning let's pick on the girls for a minute. Let, let's imagine that, that a man and a woman get married. And, and that dog, they're so much in love, and everything's just going so wonderful. But then, along the path, all of a sudden, she starts getting this roving eye. Maybe, maybe she, she finds another guy. And she thinks. I want, to, I want to give my love to her, to him. But rather than my husband, I'm going to start loving this guy. And she gives giving her, him her affection, giving him her love. 
But then, you know, as she's over here loving some other guy, all of a sudden she, she goes back to her husband and asks for things she needs. You know, it's kind of like, uh, honey, can, can I have $300 to pay this bill? Or my car just broke down. I don't know what to do. Can you help me? I, I, I'm, I'm stuck. I need a place to live. Can, can I move back in with you? What do you think that man is going to say? I'll tell you what, most men is going to say, no. I mean, and then it's going to be fine. No. We, I'm not, no. You're all there in love with some other guy. But don't we do that in our prayer life? We're loving the things of the world. Then we're going to God for what we need. Well, we're, we're, we're over here loving all. Oh, I, I, I'm so important in society. I look so big at my job. My kids are the most wonderful on the face of the earth. But God, we're struggling here. Can you help? Now, notice what James said. James says, you adulterers and adulteresses, you're trying, to, you're trying to keep a relationship with the world and with God at the same time. And no matter how you slice it, that doesn't work. He says, you're asking for things. You're praying. But what you ask for, you ask with the wrong motives. Because it's all about you. When we became Christians, we became the bride of Christ. And that bride is to remain faithful to, to, to our husband, who is Christ. We're to be faithful to him. But when we go embracing the world, we're, we're ignoring Christ. James says, you can't be a friend of the world and walk the worldly path and expect God to keep on blessing in your life. He says, you're asking. But nothing's happening. Why? Because you're asking with the wrong motives. We need to avoid foolish praying. How do we do that? We make sure that our prayers are focused on God's glory, not ours. How do we have a greater prayer life? First of all, we've got to pray. When we avoid praying foolishly. And number three, pray faithfully. When we're to pray faithfully. In the rest of the passage that we read, verses 5 through 10, what James is going to do is he's going to give us some powerful principles that to teach us the kind of prayer life or teach us things about our prayer life that we need to know. So to make them simple for us this morning, I'm going to call them the five S's of prayer. Each one of them is going to start with an S. That way, this afternoon when you go home and you're sitting there eating lunch, you can discuss those five S's and it'll help you remember. But the five things about our prayer life that, we, that help us to pray faithfully. First one, be sensitive. Be sensitive. Look at verse 5. Verse 5, well, what James tells us is that the Spirit of God, you know, the Spirit that lives inside a born again believer, the Spirit of God strongly desires for God to be glorified. So, so the Spirit that lives inside of the born-again Christian is desiring for God to be glorified. So, so he wants God to get every bit of honor, every bit of glory. So what way is that Spirit going to guide us to glorify God? But what we have to do is we have to be sensitive to how the Holy Spirit is directing our lives. How is the Holy Spirit directing us to pray? Because it's going to direct us to glorify God rather than glorify ourselves. <laughs> so are we fighting against the Spirit? Or are we being sensitive to how the Spirit teaches us to pray? The, the Holy Spirit will teach us to pray for those things that honor God, those things that glorify Him. So the first thing in praying faithfully we have to be sensitive to how the Holy Spirit that, that already lives inside of us as a believer 
is godliness. So number one, be sensitive. Number two, be submissive. Now I know that's the S word that just most folks go, nope. I don't care what you're going to say about it. Submissive, no, that's not me. I'm a person that likes to walk my own walk and talk my own talk. But look what he says in verse 6. But he gives more grace. Wherefore he says, God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Another thing that the Spirit of God does in our life is works in us to make us submissive to God the Father. When we realize that prayer is not about getting what we want, but it's about what God wants. When we turn over that, that rule, that rule of our life to him, to say it's not about what I want. I want to pray for what you want, God. That's submissive. It is about God working in us so that his will can be accomplished, not our will. It's about letting God take over and we be under his authority. When we get to the place that we want nothing more than what God wants. When his will becomes our will. When, when we're willing to surrender our plans, our goals, our wants, our wishes to that of the Father, we're being submissive to him. And folks, when we're submissive to him, we'll see prayers answered. So, how do we pray faithfully? Be sensitive to the work of the Spirit. Be submissive to the will of the Father. And number three, be steadfast. Do you realize that when we pray, we're at war? Praying is warfare. I'll give you this afternoon, turn to Ephesians 6 and, and read those verses, especially verse 10 to 20. Because in Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul is telling these believers about putting on the armor of God. Maybe you remember that story. That they're to put on the, the shield of faith and the, the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness. And the shoes shod for the gospel of peace. And, and he gives them all these things that he tells them. And take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. What he is telling them is that as a Christian, we are involved in war. And it's not a war with other nations or other people. It's not a war with our family. It's not a war with our co-workers. It's a spiritual war. It's a war between, between the godly and the evil. And he says, you are in that battle. So you need to put on the, the, the armor to get ready. Then he tells us to go to battle. And after we've got all dressed up for war, Paul tells his believers to pray. You see, because when we pray, that's the battle. When we pray, it's a war that's going on. We go to battle when we battle pray. So prayer's not to be flippant. Prayer's not to be some meaningless ramble. Lord, Lord I know you're going to bless me because I said more words today than I did yesterday. That sounds silly, but how many of us actually do that? You know, I prayed for, well, I got 60 seconds in today. That's 30 more than yesterday. God's going to bless me today. That's not prayer. Prayer is to be steadfast. When, when we, when it's time to draw the soul of the Spirit and go to war with the enemy, we must be sent first, be sent to the Spirit. Well, we, we must be strong. Submit to the Father. And then we stand strong. Because we're at war. So folks, when we go to pray, we have to know that, that prayer, we're to be steadfast, strong. Because we are at war. So how do we pray faithfully? Be sensitive. Be submissive. Be steadfast. Stand strong. Number four, be separated. Look at verse 8. 
Verse 8 says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands and sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Let me tell you what, what, what verse 8 is telling us. Verse 8 is telling us a very simple principle. You can't face in two directions at the same time. You, you can't. You know, this afternoon, some of you are going to try it. I know. But you can't face in two directions at the same time. Here's what that means. You can't come to God but still be hanging on to that open sin. You, you, you can't, you, we can't do both. If we're going to go to God, we've got to get rid of the sin. Because as we're trying to go to God, guess what's holding us back? Guess what's trying to turn us around? So, so we have to be separated. Now, I will tell you something this morning. I can tell you this for a fact. Every person in this room right now is separated. I can guarantee it, because you're separated in one of two ways. Some, because of sin, are separated from God. Because when there is unconfessed sin in our life, what that does is that puts a wedge between us and God. And it separates us. Until that sin is confessed, and, and God tells us when we confess it, he'll forgive it. But until it is confessed and forgiven, that wedge is there, and that sin separates us from God. So there are some in this room, I guarantee you, who are separated from God. The other separation is those who are separated from the world. Because when we confess our sin, when we ask for God's forgiveness, that we turn from it because that sin no longer is holding us, we are now close to God. So as we pray, you want to pray faithfully, you have to be separated from that sin. You can't be both. You, you can't be with God and with the things of the world at the same time. Oh, I love Jesus. Pastor, I won't be here next Sunday because i got this going on. I haven't read my Bible for a week because, did you know? It's the finals uh, of my favorite show, and it's every night this week. <laughs> Sorry, God. It's NASCAR season. So you're not going to see me or hear from me for a while. Because when them gentlemen start their engines, that's it. We could have said the same about football, basketball. But we have to ask ourselves, are we separated? Or how are we separated? Right now, is our sin separating us from God? Or is God separating us from the world? How do we pray faithfully? We're separate. Number five, be sincere. Verses 9 and 10, it, Paul talks about how, how they're to, to pray. He says there, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your, your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. We've already said that prayer is not to be something done flippantly or carelessly with, with endless words. But I think, here's what I think happens often in our lives. Maybe I shouldn't speak for you, I'll speak for me. I think sometimes I pray, and ten minutes later, I couldn't even tell you what I prayed to God. Was I just saying words? Did, did they have any meaning? How many times have we been in, in, in our, what may be our meager attempts to pray? All of a sudden we realize I was just saying words and I didn't even mean what I said. Or I didn't even know what I said. Maybe it's when we lay down to go to sleep. Lord, thank you for our day. Help us sleep good. Bless tomorrow. Oh, you know, tomorrow I got to do this and this and this and this. Oh, what am I going to Sorry, God. Maybe it's when we submit. Maybe our, our prayer is when we sit down to eat. Lord, thank you for. I was doing. 
and meet us this evening. As we pray, as we pray faithfully, let us take prayer seriously. If I want to have an effective prayer life, then I need to get serious about prayer, and I need to get serious when I pray. Because prayer needs to be my top priority. This is the pilot. I'm descending rapidly. What do I do? I'm about to pray. I want to ask you this morning. Is prayer right now in your life? Is prayer your last resort? Or is it your first response? Maybe we need to start simply. Do you pray? No, I'm not just talking about this few words before we eat. Have you established a time that you pray to God? How often is that? Is it every day? I'll admit to you. I think we could always pray more. But let's just start simply. Do we pray? Maybe for you today, your, your commitment to God is to say, I've not even been praying. God, forgive me for that as I turn from my sin to follow Jesus. Do you pray? Or maybe my question for you this morning is, do you pray foolishly? I want to challenge you to do something. I started doing this a little over a year ago. And, and, and I keep a journal. When I pray, I just I can't write out my prayers. My mind and my hand don't go the same speed. So I, I might just make notes to, as I'm praying to, to kind of something to go back on. Maybe for you to keep a journal. Maybe it's just as you pray. Why don't you start doing a checklist of what you're, what you're coming to God for? And as you make that checklist, I want you to evaluate it. How much on that checklist is me focused? And how much is God glorified? And then let's just let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Because maybe this morning you realize your prayers are more me focused than God glorified. You know what we do for that? We confess our sin. We turn from it. That's what repentance is, to follow Jesus. So, so maybe this morning you're praying, but you've been praying foolishly. You just wouldn't pray it for yourself. Or maybe this morning you need to look at one of these five things as you pray faithfully. Maybe this morning God's Spirit spoke to you to say, hey, there's a change that needs to happen. Maybe it's a change in thought. Maybe it's a change in action. Maybe it's a change as you pray. This morning, will you surrender that to God? And just give that to Him. In just a moment, we're going to sing a final hymn. And as we do, I want to ask you, the decision that God's laid on your heart to make, before you go home, before you get in your car, but before we say our final amen, will you make that decision for and turn that to him. Maybe it's to pray. Maybe it's to pray, not pray foolishly. Maybe it's to begin to pray faithfully. Maybe for the first time you realize you're at war when you pray. And when you pray, that's when the battle's going on. And you need to make a, a, a decision for Christ. Maybe this morning your decision for Christ is going to involve prayer, but it's about your personal relationship or walk with him. And today, you're ready to turn from that sin and follow Jesus Christ for the first time and accept his gift of salvation. Maybe you've got a burden going on, something that you've been struggling with, and, and you've been fighting and warring and struggling. But now it's time to ask. I want to ask you, maybe as we sing, 
You want to come and kneel at this altar? Then I invite you to come and kneel. You've made a decision for Christ and you need to let folks know. Then I'll stand beside you as we let folks know that, hey, your life belongs to Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to be obedient in some way. But folks, before we leave here, whatever God's Spirit is speaking to our hearts, let's say yes and let him have his way. Father God, I thank you for your word. And then what I ask you, as each one of us, let your spirit work in our lives. I pray, Lord, that we say yes to you and follow you. And our prayer lives become greater prayer lives because of what we're allowing you to do in our life. For every decision that needs to be made this morning, Lord, I pray for that person that needs to make those decisions. That they will, they will say yes to you. Turn from their sin and follow Jesus. It's in Jesus' name I pray.